Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 15, June 28th through July 4th, 1861. First, may I say, happy 4th of July, everyone. At this point in the war, we are only 85 years from the Declaration of Independence, so really not that long ago. Last week, we had a nice discussion on strategy and tactics, as well as mentioned artillery and cavalry. It's good we talked about cavalry because this week we will introduce one of the most iconic cavalry officers of the war. We will focus for a bit on the northwest of Virginia and what is now today West Virginia, actually, and an important small engagement that is leading up to uh, the Battle of First Manassas or First Bull Run, uh, at least the start of that campaign. I also want to mention briefly about immigrant and foreign troops, as well as close out today with a brief overview of the institution of slavery, uh, a bit overdue, but uh, uh, feel like still need to still need to jump into that. So uh, let's get into it. On July 2nd, 1861, we have the Battle of Hoax Run. This would pit around 8,000 Federals against 4,000 Confederates under Thomas Jackson, although I have seen many different estimated totals, including that the Confederates numbered maybe even as little as 2,000. At this point, it is a single brigade under Colonel Jackson, that is to say, so that's uh, at least uh, we, we know it's a pretty sm- smaller force comparatively to what uh, he will command in the future. On the other side of the field, we will have two brigades under the overall command of Robert Patterson. Now, if you were unfamiliar, let's talk a little bit about the geography of the situation. We have mentioned a little bit about the importance of the Shenandoah Valley to the Confederacy in previous episodes. Troops would be stationed there under command of Joseph E. Johnston. Johnston was a native of Farmville, Virginia, And if you are unfamiliar with uh, the Old Dominion, that is a real place and not just an online game. So uh, there is a real place called Farmville. He attended West Point, but resigned to study civil engineering before rejoining the Army to serve in the Seminole and Mexican-American War. By 1860, he was Quartermaster General in California and would be the highest ranking officer to resign his commission in order to join the Confederacy. Johnson is important to note as he will be connected to our story all the way to the end. Jefferson Davis, though, was not a very big fan of Johnston, arguing about the Southern strategy we talked about. One of the arguments you see is that if the general had been utilized properly, things might have been different, but it's one of those ifs and buts moments, kind of, right? Actually, Ulysses S. Grant was quoted as having said that Johnston gave him the most trouble out of any of the Confederate officers. Now, um, you might say, perhaps, you know, it's sort of like taking some shots at Robert E. Lee there uh, after the fact. Um, but still, you know, it, uh, Grant does does say that in his, uh, in his memoirs. Anyway, Johnston would be responsible with forming the Army of the Shenandoah. Winchester was a key town. Uh, that sat at the beginning of the valley. Robert Patterson would move his 20,000 men out of Williamsport, Maryland, and move toward Martinsburg, which was only 25 miles north of Winchester. Let's pause and talk a little about some important names. Robert Patterson is the commander of the Union forces moving out from Williamsport. Patterson may not have been the right guy for the job, though. He had served as an officer in the War of 1812, and although a young man during that conflict, he was still rising in age. Patterson would gain fame during the Mexican-American War, being wounded at Cerro Gordo. He would also be enjoying post-military life prior to the war, gaining wealth from several cotton mills. Winfield Scott would give orders for Patterson to move out, but they were fairly vague. Retake Harper's Ferry was the objective, 
However, putting pressure on the Confederate forces in the valley was also important. Under his command is John Abercrombie, who, although a colonel at this point, will rise to the rank of general. Abercrombie was also the son-in-law of Patterson, so we have a family connection. He's also up there in age, though, being 63 uh, in 1861. He serves during the Peninsula Campaign, but would then be restricted to a more administrative role for the rest of the war. Our friend Abner Doubleday, who, if you remember, we, t- we talked about when we talked about Fort Sumter, is also attached to this force, commanding a battery of artillery. Also serving under the command of Patterson was one George Thomas. George Thomas is probably the most underrated general of the war, in my opinion. He will play a big part in the Union victory, serving mostly in the Western theaters. It may surprise you to know that Thomas was a native Virginian. He was born in Southampton County in 1816. And he would witness Nat Turner's slave uprising in that area, which occurred around in the 1830s, which may have changed his attitude about the institution. Thomas would attend West Point on the recommendation of his local congressman. During the Mexican-American War, he would serve with his future opponent, Braxton Bragg. Thomas would marry Francis Kellogg, a New Yorker he met while at West Point, teaching. That's post-Mexican-American War. George would also be close to Robert E. Lee at this time. While serving in the cavalry, he would be involved in a skirmish where an arrow would pierce his chin and partially lodge into his chest. Thomas would pull the arrow out and keep leading his men. Think about that next time you get a paper cut. Deciding to join the Confederate forces or remain in the Union was a tough choice. Thomas had applied to become superintendent at the Virginia Military Institute before the first shots were fired. He would turn down a further appointment in the Confederate Army. Instead of following suit with other Southern officers, Thomas would stay committed to the Union, most probably influenced in some part by his wife. The rest of his family would disavow him for the remainder of his days as a result. Thomas would be well-liked by his soldiers and would actually become to be known as Pap Thomas affectionately. The command of the cavalry contingent attached to Jackson would be none other than James Ewell Brown Stewart. Jeb Stewart would be probably the most iconic and recognized cavalry commander in the Civil War. To connect him to Thomas, Stewart was apparently not happy at his fellow Virginians' decision to remain in the U.S. Army, stating, I would like to hang hang him as a traitor to his native state. Jeb was born in Patrick County, Virginia, the son of an 1812 veteran and great-grandson of a Revolutionary War veteran. He would attend Emory and Henry College before West Point. Jeb has been in our story already. If you remember, he was present during John Brown's raid and served with the cavalry at Fort Levensworth, Kansas. In fact, he was present during the raid uh, to identify Brown, whom he was aware of during that period. Apparently, he was quite the ladies' man, engaged to his wife after only two months, and writing in his journal, jokingly, Vinny VD, VG. That's, I came, I saw, I conquered, for those of us um, who are either not familiar with Latin or unfamiliar with uh, Julius Caesar either. Stuart would resign his commission to serve in the Confederate Army. Colonel Jackson would attempt to delay the Union forces under Thomas and Abercrombie, which he does effectively. On July 1st, Stuart's cavalry would alert the Confederates to the Union approach, and Jackson's men will fire upon their enemy before withdrawing. In possession of the Confederate camp, Stuart would actually wheel his cavalry around and take a few prisoners. On the 2nd, Jackson's men would fight briefly again before withdrawing. Casualty figures 
are all over the place um, from uh, you know different sources that I've seen. As low as around 10 killed and wounded per side, and as high as 90 total for the Confederates. Although a Union victory, Jackson did the job and delayed the advance of the enemy. Patterson's forces would occupy Martinsburg and advance as far as Bunker Hill, which is approximately 12 miles from Winchester. Instead of moving on the Virginian city, Patterson will move east to Charlestown before moving to Harper's Ferry. Because he is no longer putting pressure on Johnson's men, they are able to travel to support PGT Beauregard's men at Manassas Junction. Patterson is often blamed heavily for this failure, and maybe that blame is correct, or maybe he was simply the wrong guy for the job, as mentioned. I would like to mention briefly about the role of immigrant troops during the war. It is estimated that some 400,000 immigrant soldiers would fight for the Union during the war. Most of them would be German and Irish, but they were not the only ones uh, as I will get into. I think it is important to mention the motivations of these individuals. We may have mentioned a little bit during our motivation segment an episode or two back. It may evolve down to a paycheck. As mentioned, Irish immigrants, especially in New York, were denied jobs. Many would see the steady paycheck the army would provide as necessary. Many Irish would remain Democrats and not necessarily be too keen on emancipation because there was a real fear of the influx of new workers into the already crowded job market. Gaining valuable military experience could lead to a reclaiming of Ireland from the hands of the British. I will do a segment in the future about an invasion of Canada by Irish veterans of the Civil War, uh, which is a pretty interesting topic and not something that you usually uh, hear about. Some Irish, Germans, and other Europeans would see the support of abolition to be a continuation of their revolutionary struggles uh, across the pond. 1848 had seen many revolutions in Germany, Hungary, and France, among other places. Young Europeans who had uprooted as a result would want to continue their cause. Immigrants would want to show patriotism toward their new country. Certainly, the Germans in Missouri were motivated by this uh, need to fit in with their adopted country, as we have already seen. Many regiments will be made up primarily of ethnic soldiers. The Irish Brigade is a brigade made up of, you, know, you, you guessed it, Irish soldiers. Thomas Francis Marr, who is an Irish revolutionary and known order, would be the commander of these men in the early part of the war. Marr had been imprisoned in Tasmania, but escaped to New York. Originally, he supported the Southern cause and gave lectures in the South. When the Catholic Church came out in support of the Union, Marr, along with other Irish, would flock to enlist. The 69th New York, part of the Irish Brigade, is still a National Guard regiment in New York today. I'm going to post a picture of the flag of the 69th New York because as I sit here and record, it's on my shirt. Green with a harp of Aaron. In the Army of Potomac, the 11th Corps would be made up of Germans. Many officers would give orders in German uh, as well. Franz Siegel was one of these more famous German generals in the Union Army, although his performance is questioned throughout the conflict. Confederates would have not as many, but still have their own units of Germans. Lieutenant Colonel Heros von Bork served on the staff of Jeb Stuart, who we talked about today. And no, I am not very confident in the pronunciation I just gave. Hans Christian Haig would become involved with the abolitionist movement and lead a unit made up of Scandinavian troops in the West. 5,000 Polish troops fight for the Union during the war, the 58th New York being mostly Polish. The Confederacy had less in terms of these immigrant soldiers, 
but still would have around 40,000 Irish fighting on their side. Patrick Claiborne, the Stonewall of the West, was probably the most famous. There would be a small number of Hispanic regiments fighting for the Confederacy as well. New Mexican volunteer regiments were raised on both sides. The Confederate regiments of the 8th and 6th Texas in the Army of Northern Virginia were made up primarily of Tejanos. The 39th New York was also known as the Garibaldi Guard, made up of Italians. We talked about the French connection with Louisiana natives. There would be other French regiments in the Union as well. Regis de Trobriand was the son of a French general and rise to become a general during the Civil War himself for the Union cause. The Confederates had their own French general in Prince Camille Armand Jules Marie de Polignac, who served in the Crimean War before being placed on the staffs of General P.G.T. Beauregard and Braxton Bragg. His men apparently did not know how to pronounce his name. I don't really know either. Uh, but I gave it my best shot, so they referred to him as Prince Polcat. He would serve in the Franco-Prussian War following the Civil War. I would also like to note that there were some 10,000 Jews who served on both sides during the war, something perhaps we do not normally think about. There were four generals in the Union Army who would be known to be of the Jewish faith. Judah P. Benjamin is the first member of the Jewish faith to hold a cabinet position in North America, serving in the Confederate government as Secretary of State, Secretary of War, and Attorney General at different points. To talk a little about the slavery experience, I will give a brief overview of the institution today. The Atlantic slave trade began in the 1500s with European colonization of West Africa. 11 million slaves would pass from the continent to North and South America from the 1500s to the 1800s, and many would die en route as maximum capacity was the focus rather than, say, comfort. Now, there were exceptions, and I think just to backtrack just a little bit, uh, West Africa uh, did have already a culture that included slavery as the norm, uh, but we should also point out that uh, slavery in, in this time, in this particular part of the world, uh, was certainly a lot less brutal than in the Americas, right? So slaves were often conquest of war. If you were in debt to somebody, you could become a slave. Those kinds of, of transactions uh, did occur. And oftentimes, a slave would become part of the family, so they would not be um, as seen as, as, say, property. So de definitely a very different uh, mindset. And when we're talking about the passage of slaves from continent to continent, um, certainly there were a lot of slaves who, who went to the Americas, but most of them did go to South America and the Caribbean. There were only about 5% of slaves did make their way um, to what, what would that time have been the British colonies uh, in North America, right? Now, there were some ship captains who were focused on uh, getting their cargo safely to the Americas. Um, so there were occasions where there were not quite so uh, terrible in terms of conditions, uh, but there were also other scenarios where captains were more uh, interested on just making the journey, um, and, and you know there were going to be um, some slaves who uh, unfortunately perished, and that was just sort of a reality, right? So they, it didn't really matter to them, um, unfortunately. I think something else that we should mention as well is that um, sort of the the need for uh, African slaves to supplement the Americas uh, was was given from the the lack of uh, natives here in in the Americas, especially you know Spanish um, forced many uh, of the indigenous peoples to work 
in mines and, and unfortunately many of them would succumb to diseases, European diseases. Um, so there was sort of this need for um, uh, slaves to supplement that labor. So that's why there were uh, many who, who wanted to, to pull slaves uh, and bring them, uh, bring them to America. So that was part of that motivation as well. You know, early in the continent, you know, early in the, the colonies, I guess we can say so, like, say, Jamestown, uh, there were slaves. Uh, however, uh, they were treated a little bit differently. You know, there was indentured servitude. So a lot of the uh, early African slaves uh, were treated in the same manner. And actually, many of them uh, were able to, to earn their freedom, at least early on in the colonies. So it's not till a little bit later that we have this kind of shift in, in that kind of uh, culture and that sort of uh, mindset toward toward African slaves. If you re remember, though, in 1807, that's going to mark the end of the international trade in America, uh, where there were still southern smugglers who made the journeys. Hence, when we talked about the combined British and U.S. Navy efforts to bring those illegal activities to heel. The lack of of international trade actually led to the hiring out of slaves, as we have mentioned in the case of Virginia, uh, plantations moving further south to the larger and more profitable uh, southern plantations. Families could be separated in this case, unfortunately. A healthy black male could cost as much as $3,000 for interested buyers. Generally, when we talk about slaves in the antebellum period, there were three categories field slaves, skilled slaves, and house slaves. Field slaves would be working the land. Their duties would include harvesting crops, tending to livestock, and building or performing necessary repairs. Experiences would vary, but some would work seven days a week at all times during daylight hours. Pregnant women were also expected to work in many cases. House slaves would tend to the cooking and cleaning of the household, as well as care of the children of the owner. Skilled slaves would perform various duties. Perhaps they were blacksmiths or carpenters. Sarah Gudger, a slave from North Carolina, wrote, I never knowed what it was to rest. I just work all the time from morning till late at night. Regardless of field, house, or skilled, this was often true not an ideal existence. I took a Virginia history course in college where the professor asked what the ideal living situation was, and it was one of those questions where the answer was none of them, right? Like, no matter what you, how you sliced it, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't going to be good. In the home, you may be more vulnerable to sexual assault and the wrath of an angry plantation owner. One account I read included a cook who would be terrified if the master did not enjoy the food. Uh, if he did not, uh, she would be whipped. Diet was also restricted for most slaves. Little in either meat or vegetables was given. Malnutrition was common. As could be expected, there were no real punishments for any kind of treatment of slaves. Murdering a slave was the exception, and this was usually paid with a fine. Given these descriptions, I think we can understand the appeal for escape to the north, or say if there is a Union army nearby, like the case with Benjamin Butler, seeking refuge might also be a good option. Slaves might also fight back against their masters in the form of slackening on work or deliberately destroying tools or killing livestock. Especially with a majority of overseers fighting the war, this would be the case although many slaves would be used for the war effort in the South, as already mentioned. I hope at a later point to look at slave insurrections, of which there were not many, but at least Nat Turner's Rebellion and maybe a few others like Denmark Vesey or Gabriel Prosser. That will just about do it. We opened up with the Manassas Campaign and talked about immigrant and foreign troops during the Civil War, and they're larger than you might expect impact. We ended up with a good idea of what it may be like to be a slave in the antebellum period. From this, I think we can further understand the importance of emancipation. Next week, we will head back to Western Virginia, 
as well as Missouri to see what is going on in both those places. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be welcome. Once again, feedback is also appreciated. Uh, The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Questions, comments, concerns, all very much welcome. Thank you so much for listening, and have a great week.